This module is on the crisis behavior cycle, the third stage or phase, the physically acting out phase. If you haven't listened to the two previous modules that cover the two previous phases prior to getting to the physically acting out phase, you need to go back and listen to those first. You want to listen to the one on the tension phase and the next one on the escalation phase because they lay the groundwork for how a person arrives at the physically acting out phase. My name is Mike Woods. I have a master's degree in conflict management. I'm an autism and inclusion specialist for St. Louis's largest school district, father of triplet boys, each on the autism spectrum. And if you need more information on a variety of topics, you can go to my website, www.makingroom.net. I'm talking today about the crisis development phases. Again, I mentioned in the previous slide, first is the tension phase and there is a particular response that you need to have to an individual who's in the tension phase. That's followed by the escalation phase of crisis continues to develop and that requires yet a different response than the tension phase did. This module is going to be on the physically acting out phase. And so again I would encourage you to go back and listen to the other two modules in order to get up to speed for what we're going to talk about today. Previously, we talked about social exchange theory. And social exchange theory was the concept that your behaviors, verbal or physical, affect me and what I do. And what I do, in turn, affects you, that we each have an effect on each other. And the crisis development cycle, then, our responses to a person's behaviors, verbal or physical, are going to either serve to make that situation better or make it worse. In the first module, we talked about the tension phase and our response to a person in the tension phase is to be supportive and I talked more in depth about what that was in that particular module. If crisis continues to escalate the next phase is the escalation phase and at the escalation phase we talked about our response should be something along the lines of setting limits and again in that module I was a little bit more specific about what that was. In this module for someone who's at the physically acting out level our response in order to de-escalate conflict or the crisis is going to be different than the previous two phases. We're going to talk about emergency response procedures. There is nothing that we do at this level that can be considered therapeutic. At this level, when a person's physically acting out, our job is to keep everybody safe, the person who's acting out, ourselves, and anyone else involved. Let's start out by giving a definition to the physically acting out phase. The physically acting out phase could be defined as the phase at which a total loss of control that results in a physical acting out episode. That physical acting out could be biting, headbutting, pushing, hitting, kicking, whatever it may be, this is the phase at which a person now starts to physically act out. This has not occurred in the two previous phases and that's why our responses were different. At this phase, if someone is physically acting out towards themselves or someone else, you can consider yourself the physically acting out phase. Now, how does someone get to this phase? Well, very possibly it could be that there wasn't any intervention or that there wasn't an effective intervention at the escalation level. Again, if the crisis development cycle escalates, you go from one phase to the next, if there was no preventative measures that were effective at the escalation phase, then there is a likelihood that a person might start to physically act out. What else can cause someone to be at the physically acting out phase? It could be that people's responses were to be physical towards that person while they were at the tension phase or the escalation phase. In other words, there was a physical hands-on that occurred at an earlier level or earlier phase. Other causes could be some type of physical crisis and experiencing physical and or emotional pain. Or there could have been emotional crisis and experiencing emotional and or physical pain. All of these things can lead someone to transition into the physically acting out phase. What are some other important things to know about the physically acting out phase? Well, one is, is that the adrenaline at this phase, adrenaline is as at its maximal levels not only for the student or your child or the client, whatever the case may be, but also yours. 
And what that means is, not only is there an abundance of energy and strength at this physically acting out phase on everyone's part because of the adrenaline, but also as a result of that, we all have a higher pain tolerance. And that means we may not pain may not register as quickly for to us or for us or the other person involved. This is also the point, the physically acting out phase, at which there's a highest risk of injury to the child, the student, the client, and yourself or other staff members. Why? Because of these maximum adrenaline levels. Also, the person's reasoning skills, compromising skills, and self-control at this level are at their lowest, perhaps even simply non-existent. If pushed enough, either verbally or physically at this level, this can cause a person to become more physically aggressive to self or others. So you need to be careful of that. And the other thing, the other reality about this level is simply this, is that once you're at this level, it usually has to run its course. The interventions that you might have tried at the tension phase or at the escalation phase are going to be useless at this level for the most part, uh, primarily because if they would have worked, they would have worked then at, and at this point because reasoning skills, logical thinking skills are at their lowest or non-existent. It's not going to have much of an effect. This is a level at which typically you don't want to be too verbal because a lot of your talking just simply isn't going to register. So the bad news and the good news is this level typically has to run its course. That's the bad news. It's going to last as long as it's going to last. The good news is, is that once a person's emotional energy and physical energy expends itself, they're going to transition out of this phase. And so a person can only physically act out for so long before emotionally and physically they drain themselves. And at that point, you'll move out of this phase regardless of what else has happened in this phase. Something else I want to point out about the physically acting out phase, the reality is this, despite your best efforts, despite trying to do everything perfectly at the tension phase as far as how you respond and how you respond at the escalation phase, sometimes despite your best efforts, there are going to be times when someone's behavior becomes dangerous when they physically act out. It's through no fault of your own, even if you remain calm, and you do everything that you can possibly do that would have been appropriate, you can still arrive at the physical acting out phase. The best response to this behavior level, this particular phase, is to have emergency response procedures. Friends, this is not, a, whatever you do in response at this level for someone that's physically acting out is not therapeutic. You have someone at this point who is being self-injurious to themselves or physically aggressive towards others. There is a threat of bodily harm either to oneself or to staff members or parents, whoever may be involved in this, and it requires emergency response procedures. Again, there's nothing therapeutic about what you do at this particular phase. That's why I'm going to encourage you if you are involved with someone who gets to this phase, I'm going to encourage you to seek professional help. You need to find folks who are certified, licensed, very qualified to know what to do with someone who is physically acting out. Typically during the physical acting out phase, physical control positions, or what's called restraints, have to be used. But I need to make this loud and clear. They're only used as a last resort when the person presents a danger to himself or someone else. Let me say that again. Legally, ethically, at this physically acting out phase, the use of physical control positions or restraints are used only as a last resort when the person presents a danger to himself or someone else. I've seen testimonies before Congress where people have restrained students in the classroom because he or she didn't blow their nose. I've heard of stories where people have restrained someone because they wouldn't sit at their desk and finish their homework. Restraint is not used for any other circumstance than as a last resort when the person presents a danger to himself or someone else. Again, their restraints are only used when the student 
your child, client, whoever it may be, has become a danger to himself or someone else. That is what an emergency response procedure is at this point when someone is doing that. If they're physically acting out but not being a danger to themselves or someone else, then you don't have to restrain the person. Again, I would encourage you to seek professional assistance from qualified people who know what to do with someone who's at this level. I was talking to a parent the other day. She was sharing with me that sometimes when her son is at this level, physically acting out, she leaves the room. And you know what he does? He stays in the room. And then eventually he calms down because there's no one else around and he gets over it. Again, as I was mentioning before, the physical acting out phase will only last so long. A person's emotional energy and physical energy will deplete itself, in which case the person will be calm at some particular point. She was able to arrive at this particular point simply by leaving the room. And I would thoroughly encourage you to do that or anything else that you might be able to do to de-escalate the situation without having to use a physical control position or what's commonly referred to as a restraint. Again, a restraint is something that's only used as a last resort when the person is presenting a danger to himself or someone else. Physical interventions, folks, present a risk. There is a risk of injury, not only to the child, the student, the client, but also to you, the teacher, the parent, or the staff member. And all physical interventions should be considered potentially dangerous. Folks, restraint positions, I'll talk about them here in a second. Uh, but any physical intervention should be considered potentially dangerous. And again, if you're going to use it, it can only be used as a last resort. When someone's restrained, it should be done for their own safety, and it should be done in a way that protects them, that doesn't harm them. That being said, again, I would caution you to do anything other than seek qualified professional help and how to do restraints or control positions. There's a lot of dangers of restraints and again I'm just going to talk about it a little bit longer because I really want to put some fear into you. Um, if you're ever thinking about having to restrain somebody it should be again as a last resort. Restraint related positional asphyxia can occur when the person who's being restrained is placed in a position in which he or she can't breathe properly and is not able to take in enough oxygen. Okay, What results from the lack of oxygen? Well, death does because it produces a disturbance in the heart and an ability to breathe and it, it compresses the diaphragm so a person can't breathe. So when an adult uh, attempts to do a control position, they have to be especially careful not to use their own bodies in a way that restricts the restrained person's ability to breathe. This includes laying across a person's back, on their stomach, laying on the floor, uh, when that person's laying face down. Remember that there are risks involved in any physical intervention. Therefore, they should only be considered when the danger presented by the acting out person outweighs the risk of that physical intervention. There are specific laws or regulations from different states and different agencies on the use of restraints. You need to know those policies and procedures because they can apply and result in legal implications if you're not careful. All right. The events that lead up to a crisis situation and the struggle that occurs during a restraint can result in a lot of stress for the individual being restrained. And sometimes that negative stress is called distress. So we always want to keep in mind uh, that restraint has the potential risk of hurting someone that we have the potential of being hurt also and avoid that at all costs. So basically that's the background behind the physically acting out phase. Again I would encourage you if you're a parent or a staff member who's involved in having to restrain someone because their behaviors are a last resort, that they're being a danger to themselves or someone else, please seek professional, qualified, certified, licensed guidance. Thank you.